Hi, welcome to ACCA Management uh, um, Information, MA1, session number one. In this particular session, I'm going to be looking at the business organization and accounting. So under this particular topic, we'll cover the organization office or office organization and policy, transactions and control, double entry. Uh, cost ledger accounting and computerized system. So let's begin by defining what an office is. Hi, welcome to ACCA Management uh, um, Information, MA1, session number one. In this particular session, I'm going to be looking at the business organization and accounting. So under this particular topic, will cover the organization office or office organization and policy transactions and control double entry uh, cost ledger accounting and computerized system so let's begin by defining what an office is an office is an organization uh, an office in an organization is a center for information and administration an organization is simply a center for information and administration and we have uh, several examples of common uh, office functions in any organization uh, such as uh, purchasing office human resource office administration office you can have finance office sales and marketing offices all those uh, department offices in an organization can be described as an office an office is simply a center for information and administration that's what an office is now different organizations organize the offices in different ways some organizations have got centralized functions other organizations have got decentralized functions so when an organization has got a centralized function it means that uh, the administrative function is carried out in a single central office that's centralized centralized means uh, administrative functions are carried out in a single central office while decentralization means administrative functions uh, are carried out at various separate locations and offices that's what decentralized function is each of these uh, systems has its own advantages and disadvantages so let's start by looking at centralized function advantages advantages of centralized function number one if all administrative uh, functions are carried out in a single central office there will be consistency or in terms of decisions that are made uh, also there will be better security and control uh, head office will be able to know what is going on all over um, in all other parts of the organization and there is also economies of scale because if decisions to buy are made in a single central office then that office is able to purchase in bulk for the rest of the parts um, or functions of the organizations uh, it's possible also for the organization to employ more expert staff because you just need the expert staffs at the head office there is standardization of systems and procedures uh, which of course agrees with the issue of consistency and uniformity in terms of decisions and systems that the organization operates duplication of uh, services is avoided when you are running a centralized office let's move on and look at the advantages of decentralized system when administrative functions are decentralized it simply means that lock offices do not have to wait for tasks to be carried out by aid office. That speeds up the response of the organization to its various customers. Uh, lock offices also do not rely 100% on the head office for them to be able to carry out certain functions. So system faults in one particular office or department or part of the organization cannot delay the entire organization so system faults and delays will not affect the whole organization procedures may also be tailored to suit local offices and of course be able to suit the needs of local customers when the systems are decentralized decision making 
uh, decisions are also made by people who are familiar with the local situations than waiting for the people at the head office to decide on behalf of the local offices. So those are some of the advantages of having a decentralized uh, system. Transactions and control. Major transactions in an organization includes things like sales, purchasing, paying expenses, paying employees, purchasing non-current assets. Those are some of the common transactions that you see in every organization. Now, for us to be able to have control in the organization, we need to have a system of authorizing, the system of authorizing these uh, transactions. Uh, you need to authorize who does the sales, who does pay for what expenses and to what amount can particular managers be able to have authority to pay, who does the purchasing of non-current assets and up to what value can a particular manager be able to buy. So those uh, controls are supposed to be put in place to allow the smooth operation of an organization. So there should be authorization authorizations in regard to purchasing non-current assets, authorizations, in regard to checking, um, in regard to sales, and also credit checking of new customers, and also authorization limits. Some managers may have the authority to make payments up to a certain amount. Other managers may also have the authority to make payments beyond certain uh, levels or limits. All right, now let's come to the issue of double entry. Double entry, I know this part is also going to be covered in your FA1. So I will just do a summary of it because it's covered in details in FA1. So the basic principle of accounting is that to every debit entry, there must be an equal and opposite credit entry. That's what double entry is all about. So. Uh, debit entries in ledger accounts arises when there is an increase in assets and increase in expenses. So when you have an increase in asset, an increase in expenses, those are supposed to be debit entries. And also you got to credit uh, every increase in liability and uh, every increase in income. So debit every increase in asset and increase in expenses also debit every increase in liability and increase in income when the opposite happens of course you have to debit so if liabilities are decreasing you got to debit uh, income is decreasing you got to debit then for credit entries in regular accounts, these are going to be every increase in liability and the increase in income, you debit, you credit, and every decrease in assets and decrease in expenses, you will debit. So to summarize your double entry, we can simply say increase, uh, increase in asset and expenses are supposed to carry debit entries, vice versa and every increase in liability and increase in income should be credit entries vice versa the accounting equation says if you take assets and subtract all liabilities the amount you have must be equals to capital now capital is adjusted by things like profits and drawings so when you have when you make a profit in a particular period it increases the owner's capital and when the owners make drawings it reduces their capital what are drawings drawings these are amounts withdrawn by the owners of the business for personal use the other way of uh, writing the accounts equation is saying when we have a total of all assets that value should be equals to the total of the liabilities plus capital so that's the accounts equation now let's come to the issue of cost accounting what is cost accounting cost accounting is simply the accumulation of costs for inventory evaluation in order to meet the requirements of external reporting and also internal profit measurement that's what cost accounting is the accumulation of costs for inventory valuation purposes 
Uh, so cost accounting produces information for both financial and management accounting uh, use. So transactions must first be recorded uh, by the business in the business's books of prime entry. What we call uh, books of prime entry, these are the faced books of accounts where you record transactions. So you transfer transactions from source documents. Now, source documents are things like invoices, receipts, and everything like that. So when you transfer information from those source documents, these information is supposed to be recorded in the books of prime entries. Now, the transactions that happens in an organization can either be based on credit or cash. So we have the books of prime entry for credit transactions, such as the sales day book for sales on credit, the sales retains day book for those sales on credit that has been retained. And we also have the purchases day book for the purchases, uh, credit purchases, and the purchases retains in case they are retains. The day books for the books of prime entry for cash transactions includes the cash book, uh, that's the main cash book, and the petty cash book. Otherwise, all other transactions should be journalized. A company can either run an integrated system or an interlocking system. Integrated system combines both cost accounting and financial accounting functions in one system of ledger accounting. An, in, an interlocking uh, system has the cost ledger for cost accounting functions and the financial ledger for financial accounting functions. So an integrated system combines both. An interlocking system keeps separate ledger accounts for financial and cost accounting. Now, the following are the day books. Uh, we have the sales day books that records, of course, uh, credit sales. And when a credit sale has happened, we issue an invoice. So sales day book is simply an rec a record of all invoices sent to our credit customers. Mm -hmm. A sales returns. You see, when somebody buys on credit, you issue an invoice. When they return, you issue another document, which is a cancellation of the amount that is on the invoice for the goods that have been returned. So that document is called the credit note. So the credit note is issued when there are sales returns. So sales retains day book records any credit notes that has been issued to the customer. The purpose of issuing a credit note is to cancel the amount or part of the amount that was recorded on an invoice when the customer got goods on credit. The purchase is their book, the company is purchasing on credit. So invoices are received from suppliers for the goods that the company has purchased on credit. Again, if the company is not satisfied with certain goods, they can return the goods. So when the goods are retained, uh, the supplier will issue a credit note. So purchases retains their book, records any credit notes received from suppliers. Otherwise, apart from the sales day book and purchases day book, there are other transactions made based on cash transactions. So uh, we have a cash received day book, which records all cash receipts by the business for the cash transactions that has happened in the period. Cash payments also, uh, uh, it's part of the cash book, cash payments book uh, records all cash paid out by the organization which is paid of course as actual cash or even by check is going to be taken as cash transaction computerized uh, accounting system most organizations today are using computerized accounting system computerized process involves input processing and output so when you have your computer there are some devices that are used for inputting data in the cpu or central processing unit of the computer and once information is processed there are also other devices that are used for output let me give you the some of the examples of the devices that are used for inputting data in the computer these uh, devices includes things like the keyboard the mouse the scanner and everything else like that and also barcode readers 
things that you find in most of the super supermarkets such as ShopRite you will find uh, data input into the system or computer using barcode readers when data is processed some of the devices that are used for the output of data is the screen of the computer itself which we call the video display unit you can also use the printer to bring out hard copy of the information so that's what computerized systems are all about what are the advantages of using computerized system as compared to manual uh, number one you can process large volumes of data uh, uh, within the short period of time you see computer systems are quite faster than manual systems also retrieving data is much easier storage of large volumes of data is possible you can imagine a flash disk alone can accommodate even up to 60 120 something gb of data batch processing compared to real-time processing batch processing involves transactions time intervals uh, real-time processing means that processing of costs of transactions takes place immediately the transaction happen uh, real-time uh, processing example could be the point of sale that you find in most supermarket where a transaction happen immediately it's fed into the computer and processing is done batch processing uh, a good example could be the way checks are processed in a bank after checks are collected then uh, the tellers find separate time uh, of course after 15 hours when they begin to process those checks so that's batch uh, processing because checks will be collected from morning up to afternoon until that time when the tellers begin to process those checks so that brings us to the end of our session one chapter one in our session two chapter two we'll be looking at an introduction to management information looking at data and information and everything else thank you for your time